so to start off the day properly, I would uh, like to do a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that UBC is hosting this symposium and is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. As we're meeting here virtually today, I'd like to acknowledge that we here in the lower BC mainland are also often on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and other Coast Salish peoples. You may be joining us from many different areas, and I'd like to take a moment to appreciate and consider and give respect to the lands on which we are situated. I appreciate the land where I am as it provides me with many opportunities. And when I acknowledge being on the territory of the Musqueam people, it's rooted in an understanding that I, as a resident of Vancouver and a member of UBC, am privileged to be learning and working on territory that is not my own. A roadmap for today in the bottom right is our um, symposium website. Will, if you'd be able to maybe drop that into the chat so people have that, uh, the slides for um, the sessions today will be posted there. Uh, we have uh, something that I'm still quite uh, starstruck that we managed to pull off or that, or that, um, uh, that we, well, we have Sven Tore, who is the CEO of, um, of Jubal and the founder of H5P is going to be coming today talking to us about um, H5P in the age of AI. Afterwards, you're going to be hearing me rambling on for another hour, hour and a half on creating effective feedback before we take a look at how we can do that within H5P. And then 11.30 to 12.50 will be a community chat, uh, very much like some of that we had yesterday. And then um, we're going to have a closing plenary, which is looking at a panel of um, faculty here at UBC from various um, faculties showing how they uh, use H5P in uh, their classrooms in new and inventive ways. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the CEO of Jubal and creator of H5P, Ben Tora. Um, I was doing some research on my introduction today and was blown away when we look at just how extensive H5P is being used. There are over 200,000 installations and over 200 million users worldwide. UBC is just another one of the 433 universities that is using H5P, and this spans 42 countries. So when we think about educational impact, um, this is one of the tools that has had just an astounding impact on how we are able to provide um, content to students that make use of best practices of things like active learning, um, feedback, flexibility in creating multiple choice questions, giving us flexibility in being able to branch. So it's a, it's a tool um, that allows us to do our job better. Now with uh, generative AI coming uh, on, the, on the scene, um, this has opened up several other areas of possibility. And I would like to now welcome with immense pleasure Sven Tore to talk about uh, H5P in the age of AI. Sven Tore, thank you very much for coming. Thanks a lot, Simon. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. And most of all, thank you for hosting this event. It, it helps spread the word about H5P and uh, also helps people be better H5P authors and H5P contributors. Uh, so so uh, I'm uh, going to share my screen now and we'll be talking about uh, about generative AI and H5P for the next hour. I'll also share a link in the chat to my uh, slides and the things I'll go through today so that people can follow along and they can also uh, uh, go and revisit later. I'm trying to make this very practical and, and useful for those who listen in. So the vision of H4P is to empower everyone to create, share, and reuse interactive content. We've had the same vision from the start, and it's uh, it's very important for us, uh, and it's very important for us that we are are many people together like here, who can uh, join in on the vision and do things like this and spread spread the word. Uh, we don't have any marketing budget or marketing people. We had one for uh, a few months, but it didn't really work out for us. It's a community movement. So so it's it's uh, us here on the virtual table who are driving H4P forward. And uh, these types of events is the heart and soul of, of H4P. And then what happens when we meet generative AI? Um, we, we, we can certainly create content a lot faster. 
with AI as an assistant. Uh, we're going to look at some very concrete examples of that. Uh, and you can take with you a lot of recipes from this session on how to uh, how to use generative AI to build H5P content. It makes it much easier to build a rich content repository. So uh, we, we have the H5P hub, which is in alpha stage now. It's possible to use it from Moodle, for instance, but uh, it's not fully launched yet. Uh, generative AI will make it much easier for us to populate the hub with content that is uh, built with AI and built by humans as well. So quality assured by humans, uh, but uh, the process is sped up by AI. And uh, and uh, I, I think that is important. I, I think uh, some of the AI solutions that exist for H5P, including one I'll show you that H5P core team has built, are among the very best AI solutions in the world, but, but AI is not at all able to make perfect results. So it uh, needs to be a good mix of, of human and, uh, and machine. Uh, machine can only speed us up. It doesn't do the work for us. Uh, so what are the results when we have uh, better AI assistance for learning content? Uh, I think uh, one of the big dreams within uh, online education is more adaptive content. Having one content item, uh, being able to, to serve both the strongest students and those who need more explanations, uh, serve things in a visual way, in an experimental way, depending on how the student uh, prefer to learn or how the teacher prefer to teach. Uh, but having one content that can do it all is is too expensive today. With AI, we can uh, we can achieve that, those super smart content items that can uh, deliver a customized learning experience for each individual or each scenario. We can cover more with interactive content. Uh, so uh, I don't know exactly how it is in, in Canada. I know in Norway that uh, for, for, for both uh, public projects and also private publishers, et cetera, they are not able to cover the entire subjects with interactive content, typically maybe the biggest courses. Uh, but um, most, most of the time you either have to pick between very simple interactive coverage or high quality coverage for just a small percentage of, of the subject. Uh, you're not able to cover it as well as you want. With AI, we can do that. Uh, so so uh, what we hope to get is, is that we can have much better content, uh, much much faster with AI, and, and, and the end result is better learning. There are lots of research papers, as you probably know, about, for instance, how much better interactive video is than normal video. and uh, if AI can help us with that, it is uh, tremendously powerful. So it can help us assist and create drafts. We'll see that today. We will have the AI create some drafts for us. Uh, it can handle uh, mundane tasks like putting uh, definitions on the right places in an interactive video. We'll see that also, also today. AI can speed up ideation. Uh, we'll, we'll see examples of how AI can come up with ideas for us on how to build uh, higher order uh, learning activities. And AI can also be used to improve language, etc. cetera. But uh, yeah, super important that authors remain in control. I won't talk a lot about this, I think. Uh, most of you are familiar with these things already, so we'll be very practical for the rest of the session. This is the roadmap for the H5P core team 2024 when it comes to AI. So we are building and maintaining prompt recipes that people can just use for free. They are just below where we'll go through them today. Uh, we've had some of them earlier, but uh, for, for this session, we built a complete set of recipes uh, for all the things you can uh, easily build with AI and H5P. We have recipes now that we'll have a look at and uh, and you guys have links to the page so you can use all these recipes to build content yourself. And we will be maintaining them. And that's actually important because uh, if you use GPT, for instance, it keeps changing. So uh, the recipes that works today might stop working in a month because GPT is interpreting things differently. So we'll be uh, keeping up with GPT and trying to make sure that these recipes uh, always work. 
And then we have something we call smart import. Uh, we built uh, for for hvp.com. So it's an example. We won't spend a lot of time on on that, but uh, just use it as an example for something you can build with uh, HVP and AI. Uh, and there are similar projects around the world that also uses H4P because H4P lends itself extremely well to AI since we have a very uh, well-defined data structure. So, so you just have to tell the AI the data structure of H4P and then the AI is able to build uh, H4P content like interactive books uh, very easily. So there are several other projects that, that also does something similar to Smart Import. And in Smart Import this year, we are going to support more languages. So today it's just English, uh, but fr French and Spanish will be added. So I think French is good news for Canada. Uh, we'll we'll uh, support that. We'll be supporting more video providers this year. We support only YouTube now, I think, but adding support for Panopto and Vimeo. Going to give authors more control. So uh, I'll demo it today and you'll see that you don't have that much control today. You give it a resource like a video and then you get to choose which concepts in the video is important for you, but nothing more. So in future versions, you can, for instance, tell it what are the learning objectives. And the moment I know the learning objectives, uh, it, it can give a much better result. So so imagine you you want an instructional designer to build interactive content for you. You wouldn't just send the instructional designer a video and no other instructions and hope it turns out well. You want to tell them what are the learning objectives. So that's coming in, in Smart Import 2.0. Uh, we are making some UI improvements. There are lots of universities using Smart Import. So like three, four more every week uh, starting to use it. Uh, so, so we've seen some things in Smart Import uh, for initial version that doesn't scale well, and uh, we're improving that. Uh, and uh, we're also completely re-implementing how we integrate with uh, with the large language models. And uh, so, so we have people from from universities testing Smart Import one with the prototype of Smart Import two, and. And uh, they are very impressed with how much more precise it is still than the first version. And we're also adding support for more content types. Uh, so single trace set, for instance. And also the chase uh, will be supported in Smart Import 2. So that's a little intro. And then we'll jump into more practical things, some examples of uh, how you can use uh, how you can use GPT and HYP together. Or you can use GPT to build H4P content. So we'll start out with the single choice set. And, and as you can see in this document, I'll give you a little overview first. We have several tips. So how to use it to build single choice set with a prompt example here. And we have bolded some of the things in the prompt that we think users are likely to want to change. So the subject, obviously put in whatever you want here. How many questions, how many alternatives, uh, things you typically might want to change in your own prompt. And then we show an example of what it looks like in the authoring tool when you paste it in and also what the end result is. And similar here, we have summary. <clears throat> we have uh, drag the words. And we have uh, three more content types. All of these are content types where you can just have GPT create something for you and you paste it directly into H4P and you get ready-made content. So multiple choice quiz is very powerful. We'll show an example of that. Fill in the blanks, mark the words. And we've also today added a section here with more specific prompts. Uh, so here you learn how to, uh, how, how to make, the, for instance, include uh, learning objectives or age or stuff like that to get a more fine-tuned result from GPT. And the last thing we'll show you is, uh, is uh, how Smart Import works. But we'll, we'll take it from uh, where we can skip single choice set. We can go summary. So here we want to create a summary about chat GPT. So I'll take the prompt here from the recipe page. And I'll go into chat GPT. And I'll paste in the prompt. 
and now ChatGPT will start generating content for us uh, so, so that we can get the interactive summary very quickly. Uh, it's This is for GPT. We have optimized it for GPT. You'll be able to use the same prompts in other uh, competing tools as well. Might be that you have to do minor adjustments to get the format right, but uh, the idea is, is the same. We've tested some of it in BART, I think it was, and worked quite well. So here we have, <clears throat> have uh, GPT created the uh, interactive summary for us, and I'll click copy code. And I'll go to uh, h4p.com. But you can obviously use WordPress or anything for this. And I'll go interactive summary. Summary. And the trick here is uh, GPT quiz. The trick here in summary is to go to textual mode because uh, if not, I would have to paste one line at a time into the visual editor, it would be very cumbersome. Okay. If you go textual, you can paste it all in like this, and then you have built an interactive summary. So it's super powerful. So this is uh, this is an interactive summary built with GPT, and obviously I could go in and I could just change the subject, or I could tell GPT this is for three-year-olds, or this is for 10-year-olds, this is for... Uh, people who study a PhD, uh, this is the culture, etc., and it would give me exactly what I want. So it is actually, it can seem a little bit cumbersome that you uh, have to go between the tools, but the big advantage is that you have full control. And we're all becoming prompt engineers these days. So uh, just having these recipes on how to get the right format from uh, from uh, chat GPT uh, is, is very useful and then you can have it build really nice things for you in H5P. So here, uh, those not familiar with interactive summary, it's a super nice way to summarize, for instance, what happened in a video, what happened in a lesson. Uh, and and uh, instead of just giving the students a summary, you make them build it themselves and they'll remember it a lot better. Then Tor, we have two questions, if I may ask at the moment, pertinent to this. Yep. Um, well, the first one, uh, first person asks, would students get the correct answers when they type these questions created by ChatGPT into, uh, as far as I can understand, when they take those questions and feed them back into ChatGPT, would they get the correct answers? So is yeah. it a way that they can sort of gain? Yeah. And then, yeah, I um, do this for exams now. Yeah. <laughs> so for, so the, for the formative assessment. Um, mm -hmm. This is really cool. Is there a textual mode feature on the WordPress H5P plugin? Yep. Yeah, yes. it is exactly the same. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Those are the two questions that popped up. Yep. All the all the recipes we go through now you can be used on WordPress or Moodle or any version of H5P. So that was interactive summary. And then we'll go to the next one. Drag the words. Maybe we take. Uh, uh, yeah, we can take drag the words. So I'll cop do the same here. I copy the prompt. Go to ChatGPT. Start a new, new conversation with my little AI assistant. And what you should note here is that we've asked it uh, also to provide feedback. So here we say, include three paragraphs and three to seven drop reports per paragraph, add explanations. Here's the format you need to follow. And here we tell ChatGPT how it is supposed to add feedback based on the user's answer. And that is important because often uh, as authors, we know that adding feedback per alternative uh, adds a lot of learning, but it's also time consuming, very time consuming. So we don't always have time for that. Uh, when we have an AI assistant, we can actually make it do it for us and we just have to review. So now I got the uh, drag the words created by uh, ChatGPT. I'll go add content again. And just drag the words. And uh, I actually don't remember what this was about, Northern Lights. 
a Northern Lights quiz, and we paste in what we got from GPT in this text field here. Save. And now we've done a lot of work in a very short amount of time. I will want to review this. So here we have uh, the Northern Lights. Our natural light display in the Earth's sky. Tromsø is very popular for Northern Lights. So hotel rooms in Tromsø these days are terribly expensive because of all the tourists. These displays can vary in maybe color and complexity, I don't know. At a cost by solar wind, and I'll just answer some random things here. And now we'll see uh, we'll see what is right and wrong, but we also get the feedback section at the bottom here. So we answered in winter months, I should have answered oxygen, and it will tell us incorrect oxygen particles are responsible for green and red colors. So, so here uh, GPT has also added a feedback section for us, which is very powerful. Uh, maybe not super good examples of feedback here, but I'll show you a task later where I actually think the feedback is is uh, contributing significantly to the learning. So that was track the words. I won't show you all the examples. You can go through some of these on your own. But this one is a really good multiple choice question set. I will see even better feedback. So I'll copy the <clears throat> prompt here as well. New tab. And we run it. So these are questions about the sun. Uh, and here we, we also see in the prompt that we've told it to, for each distractor, add an explanation about why the distractor is not a correct alternative. Uh, and we also tell it what, what format to use. So this is the one where we'll see quite good explanations for the incorrect uh, alternatives. Iron, for instance, here we see it says iron while present in the sun is not a major component. And, and then it explains what the sun is actually made up of. So that is very useful feedback if you choose an incorrect alternative and, and adds uh, value to the multiple choice quiz. So we'll copy it. And we'll go in, go to add content. We go quiz question set. And uh, what is important here, the title, uh, sun quiz. And textual mode again. Question set is also the type where you have lots of fields to fill in, but you can go textual and you can just paste in everything that you got from uh, from ChatGPT, and then we save. And now we have this nice little quiz. And as, we, as I remember, Iron, for instance, was uh, one that had a nice explanation. It's not a major component. The sun is primarily co composed of hydrogen and helium. So what happens if you go carbon? Carbon is a heavier element that is much less abundant in the sun compared to hydro hydrogen and helium. So here you have really good learning what is the process that powers the sun is it new is it the photosynthesis for instance it, photosynthesis is a process used by plants and other organisms to convert light energy into chemical energy not a process that occurs in the sun so uh, yeah I, th I think this is a good good example of uh, of uh, gpt adding value and doing a lot of work for us so if we take fission uh, the process of splitting atomic nuclei is not what powers the sun. The sun's energy comes from fusion, which combines. So that is also, I think, a good explanation, in, in my opinion. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, I, I think using these uh, tools and GPT can, can help save a lot of time. We'll do one last example uh, before we start looking at smart import. Fill in the blanks and mark the words are uh, quite straightforward, I think, for uh, fill in the blanks. We can do it quickly because here we have GPT add tips for us, which is also something that we might not have time for ourselves. Adding tips to the blanks. 
Uh, so here we have it. Uh, give us a text about behavioral psychology and uh, add some blanks where the blanks are the most important words or concepts. And we also ask you to add tips for each blank. Uh, and that makes it a little easier to answer and also more clear what we're looking for. Uh, so so uh, give it a few more seconds and we should have the fill in the blank and we can see what it looks like. Fill in blanks. Uh, behavioral psychology and we paste in here. And we see what we get. So here you see all these little icons. Uh, typically when I create a fill in the blank, I don't have time for it, but but with the AI, we can have it add these tips. Scientists known for operant conditioning, for instance. Uh, here we have uh, learning by observing others as a tip. Another important concept is learning by observing others. What's another word for that? So also a, a nice example of the AI, both doing the basic work for us and maybe adding some extra value that we don't have time for ourselves. Okay, and then we'll go for a more advanced. So in this tip five section, more specific prompts, here are ideas what you can add to the prompt to ensure that you get what you are after. So add information about your target audience, add the learning objectives, add what style you want uh, the content to be. Do you want it to be fun or sophisticated? Um, and you can also ask GPT to pretend that they are something. So we have a couple of examples there. We have a funny Mr. Bean quiz example prompt. I won't do that now, not so academic, but uh, it, it does show some variation. Uh, we have also a more specific London quiz example prompt. So here we ask it to, we can copy it in and then we'll uh, look at it where GPT works. So here we tell it that first we just tell it to create a quiz about London. Then we can get anything, obviously. Then we tell it that the target audience are Spanish master degree students in English on their fourth year, which will tell it to have quite sophisticated questions. And then we tell it that the learning objectives are to learn about the most significant historical events in the Middle Age for the city of London. So with the learning objectives as well, GPT knows much better what type of London questions it should ask. Uh, and and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be much more happy with the outcome than if we just told it to create a London quiz. I think it just have one alternative left to write. And there we go. So we can uh, copy the code now and we can see what we got. again, London quiz, we use textual mode again, and we paste it in, and here we see what the event in 1066 had a profound impact on London, leading to significant changes in its governance, culture, and language. So if we go Black Death, for instance, we've also now told it to add explanations. So the Black Death occurred in the mid 14th century and although it had a significant impact on London's population, it did not directly lead to changes in governance, culture and language as the Norman conquest did. So we got a good explanation for why it was wrong. So uh, by giving it information about the target audience and what we want to learn, uh, we get both better questions, better distractors, and also I think better um, explanations on, on the incorrect questions, incorrect uh, alternatives. So in total, if I may, there's a question over here. Do you have any examples for math and statistics? Uh, I don't think we have that in uh, in there now. Um, I, I don't know how well GPT handles formulas in MathML or uh, uh, MathCheck, but, but uh, um, I think it would do really well uh, if there are no formulas. I haven't tried with formulas. I don't know how well it handles it. Thank you. Okay. 
so that is uh, the GPT, and we'll also spend a little bit of time on uh, smart import, the smart import example. Uh, and what I wanted to do now is for you to choose topics that we can use uh, uh, AI to create content for. So I will uh, put this resource into the chat, and you guys can go in and type in what subjects you want us to want us to uh, use the AI on. So this can be. This can be uh, Pythagoras, it can be butter, it can be cooking, it can be uh, dancing, I don't know, uh, any type of subjects. So just click on that link and then you can uh, fill in a form and uh, tell us what you're interested in. Ballroom dancing was the first one. We'll give it a little bit of time and see what the most popular subject is. Poetry, Victoria. Good ideas, let's play some music. Mm -hmm. Definitely in Canada with hockey in the lead here so far. So maybe we should try hockey. I have I don't know much about hockey, but we can do a hockey, and we can do something else. Uh, it's easier to go like this. Okay, learning Spanish and hockey. If we take those two, or maybe this one, the concept of monsters in cinema, it looks very interesting. So we'll take that one and hockey. And we'll have Smart Import uh, build some content for us. Let me see what YouTube have about the concept of monsters in cinema. The problem with modern monsters, not quite the same. How to create a movie monster. Okay, let's go for that one. I'll just make sure that the video has. Well, how do you design a monster? Well, the, the first rule, I think. It... Yeah, it seems to be a serious video, so I'll copy it. And I'll go to hvp.com, smart import. And I'll just paste in the URL to the video about monsters. And then. Uh, for hockey, I suspect if I just search for hockey, I'll get some entertainment stuff for hockey matches. So, uh, uh, how to play hockey, maybe? Ice hockey rules and instructions. That should be possible for the AI to build something nice out of. So, we'll try that. How to play ice hockey. Copy that URL as well, and we feed it to Smart Import. So now we have those two uh, working on transcriptions. The processor has four steps, provide content. We provided YouTube links, but we could have provided, uh, we could have uploaded videos, we could have uploaded doc files, PDFs, etc. cetera. Uh, the next step is to review the uh, transcription. Third step, we find concepts in the uh, video and the user gets to uh, gets to review if they want those concepts or not to be covered. And the last step is to choose what to build. Do you want interactive books, interactive videos, etc. So so this is uh, this should be an, a nice example of how you can you use AI and not just use it by hand as we've looked at so far, but here we have actually built a tool combining HVP and uh, uh, GPT uh, to, to do uh, more sophisticated work for us uh, more more quickly. The first one is ready with a transcription. And uh, we'll just go for it. Start the next step. And now the hockey one is ready. 
looks okay as well. And typically the transcription here is, is very precise, but if we have a mix of languages, if we had some Spanish words and some English, uh, the Spanish word could be misspelled because it, it might try to spell it as it would in English. Uh, it doesn't doesn't understand that uh, it's a mix. And then uh, it, it goes a bit wrong. We also have an overview here of what works very well with with uh, smart import and what doesn't. And it will be the same for other implementation as well. It is GPT limitations. So if it's very conceptual, uh, like uh, biology, history, psychology, etc., it has certain rules uh, or, or concepts. It works very good. If it is more procedural, how to do this, how to do that. It doesn't work that well. I, I've tried it with cooking recipes, etc., and it actually works quite well with that too, but not as good as conceptual content. And, and currently it doesn't read mathematical equations. It doesn't see what you see in the video. So if, if it's a teacher in the video who, who uh, um, constantly refers to us, we can see here, etc., it it won't work super well. But for other content, it should be good. So now we have the hockey concepts, face off, game clock, goal, ice hockey, ice drink, major penalty, minor penalty. All of these seem to make sense. If we had some strange concepts here, we would uh, we would be able to remove them. But we can just take all of them. And for the movie monster, angry, color, and as as you see here, the definition of color isn't the general definition of color. It is from the video in the context of the video. So in, in the context of movie monsters, detail is the same. So the, they also seem to make sense. And then we can choose what to build. So interactive book, higher order questions. I promise to see an example of that. We can also go crosswords for that one. We'll have it generate that hockey content. And then for the monsters, uh, let's do some conceptual uh, conceptual dialogue cards, maybe, and a quiz, and an accordion. And now we can go and look at our hockey content. So here we had the crossword first. I don't think we have time to solve it together, but we can just show solution. So here we see central ho hockey words are being put into a crossword. So stick, penalty, overtime, etc. And then we have, uh, yeah, then we got the movie monster stuff in here. Then we have the higher order questions. So here are ideas for uh, project-based learning. Uh, about uh, ice hockey, how to play ice hockey. So one idea is create a strategy for a team to effectively defend against power plays in ice hockey. Formulate a game plan for a team to successfully execute breakaways and score goals in ice hockey. So these are ideas for teachers uh, on what they can do in class. For instance, if they're running flipped classroom, they can consider doing these classroom activities. So helps helps ideation. And then the last thing we had it build about ice hockey was an interactive book. So it looks like this. We have a picture from YouTube on the front page, title, etc. And the video player was a bit slow, but here we have it. So we have eight pages of interactive book created for us. First page is the interactive video with the reader-friendly version of the text below with paragraphs. And if we play the video... How to play ice hockey. Hello, friend. We see all the concepts, all the difficult words have automatically been explained. So the first time the word is mentioned or the concept, an explanation is also popping up and in the video. We'll learn the rules of ice hockey. Ice hockey is a team sport played between two teams of six players, including a goalie, left and right. 
What's a goal in ice hockey? A goal is scored when a player successfully shoots the puck into the opposing team's net. Yeah. Defenders, left and right wing forwards, and a center. So you see lots of lots ice of hockey is played uh, on an ice rink. Ah, there was ice rink. Playing surface for ice hockey. It's a large flat area made of ice, typically indoors, where the game is played. The object of ice hockey. And then in the middle here we have a quiz. Where did that go? So here, uh, here we have auto created some uh, questions about the video. If a player is illegally impeded from behind when in possession, that was a long question. What happens when a penalty is called on a goalie in ice hockey? I don't know. Maybe penalty box. No. You don't put the goalie in the penalty box. I guess that would be harsh. No. Yeah. How long is each interval in ice hockey game? I actually know very little about ice hockey, but maybe 30 minutes, 20 minutes. Okay, it's probably a quite intense game. So lots of questions there, lots of questions at the end here as well. So depending on how long the video is, there will be more question points. Seems like we have some trouble with YouTube. But here are the questions at the end. And then on the following pages, we have a glossary, so all the concepts with explanations. We have concept cards, so what is ice hockey, uh, what is ice rink, what is game clock, what is goal, what is penalty, and then we have explanations for it, so trigger the students to think about what penalty is. We have a quiz, fill in the blank questions here, true, false. More fill in and also multiple choice. And then we have a drag the words. So here we match concepts with the uh, correct definitions. We have uh, flashcards that are not conceptual, but more about what happened in the video. So 12 cards have been built for us. What is offside in ice hockey? When an attacking player enters the defending zone ahead of the puck. And then summary. Uh, and as I said initially, this resource won't be perfect. It has been built in just a few minutes. If we were going to build this by hand with all the questions in the video, all the definitions, all these eight pages, it would take many hours probably. Uh, built in a few minutes, uh, but we can't just publish this as is. It's a good first draft. We would have to go through it and uh, maybe remove some stuff we don't want, uh, add stuff and correct stuff. Uh, maybe we're not happy with all the distractors, for instance, and we want to adjust them. So maybe we spend an hour uh, reviewing and improving, and then we can publish, but we still have saved uh, a lot of time. So when we ask our customers in, in surveys, how much faster are you? They say typically four times faster. Uh, when they count in the review time, they are four times faster at building content using AI in, in this way. And I um, think we, in the future, this is only going to be, get better. There are uh, yep. one or two questions. Um, a, a number of people saying how, how fantastic the smart import um, is. Uh, if someone's created something like an MP4 file of a video that's on their computer, not hosted on any sort of cloud service, are they able to upload that into Smart Import or would they have to upload it onto something like YouTube and then? Yeah, no, you can. You can go here with choose file and upload a video and and that will, will work, uh, work very well and we, we will store it and serve it from AWS. Fantastic. And so far, Smart Import only available within h5p.com? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And then there was uh, presumably instructions, instructors can upload course readings to prepare no stakes knowledge checks. Are there copyright issues or are there no copyright issues at stake? For Smart Import, so uh, I think Smart Import is less copyright uh, problematic than many other things. We, we tell the AI that the things you upload is the root source. It is it is the truth. So only use that. Uh, so as long as you have the copyright to what you upload, you should be uh, safer than if you, for instance, have AI generate the content for you based on nothing. Uh, but but uh, 
if you don't have the copyright to what you upload or or you don't have the copyright to make uh, alteration of it then then you are in trouble you you need to have the right license to to the original material to the video or to the document that you upload awesome thank you i can just quickly yeah. show the other things we built the monster stuff so here we have the standalone flashcards built. We could have had a interactive book about monsters built, of course, as well. And we have a quiz about monsters, referencing nature rather than other moving monsters is crucial in designing a unique and dynamic creature, maybe. So here we have a large monster quiz and uh, and we also got a interactive book about monsters with the interactive video and and uh, the same type of content that we got for hockey. So uh, both of them created in a in a few minutes here. Uh, yeah, I don't think we have time to dive more deeply into it. We just have a couple of minutes left. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the time and uh, thanks for hosting again. Thank See you guys. Bye -bye. Cheers, cheers.